stronger, dear God, that they will be able to stand firm, dear God, according to the purpose they are called. To your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Let's go. Can we remain standing after that powerful prayer? Let us um, have a powerful rendition. Standing as Comrade White. Well, I see you have. You okay, Comrade? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. After that powerful prayer, you have to lead us in a powerful rendition of Union songs. We need to be. Yes, Comrade. We meet today.
I am not going to spend too much time because we started a bit late. I just want to recognize a few of our, our brothers and sister unions who are here with us. Let us recognize Communication Workers Union who are here with us this morning. They themselves facing a fierce and raging battle on the TDC issue, but we are not here to talk about that. Let us recognize the Banking Insurance and General Workers Union. Let us recognize the Trinidad and Tobago Registered Nurses Union. Let us recognize the Postal Workers Union. Let us recognize the Fire Service Association. And of course, let us recognize members of the Blue Shirt Army coming from various units. But particularly, let us recognize the Petrochen comrades who are here who wanted to make a very clear statement with regards to the future of the Petroleum Company of Trinidad and Tobago. And let me quickly recognize our students from Presentation College San Fernando. They never miss a forum. Let's give them a round of applause. But I want us to particularly recognize them because normally we have more schools, but this week is actually a very difficult week. It's mock exams. We have started this week, but notwithstanding mock exams, the teacher along with the students felt it important to come and hear about the energy resources of Trinidad and Tobago. So let us recognize our young people who will participate in this forum. Without further ado, let me invite immediately the President General of the Oil Free Workers Trade Union and President of the Joint Trade Union Movement, Comrade Ansel, George Roger, to bring us introductory remarks. Comrade Ansel. Comrades, good morning. Better morning than that. Comrades, good morning. Good morning. Right, now we're talking. Members of the leadership of the Joint Trade Union Movement present here this morning. Special welcome to the students of Presentation College here this morning. Special welcome. Welcome to the Captain of the Union this morning. Mr. Victor Hart, the chair of TTE ITI Steering Committee. Mr. Shoin Long, Secretary, uh, Head of the TTIT Secretariat. Our own comrade Richard Lee, the General Secretary of the Board of the TU. And Mr. Martin Farrell, Representative of TTIT. All of whom will be making their contributions here this morning. And of course, comrades from the Oilfield Workers Trade Union, members of the Blue Army, members of the media, good morning. Let me first thank all of you for responding to the invitation to come and have this very important and what we would deem critical and perhaps even crucial discussion, which has to do with our energy resources, our extractive resources. Many people in the country, if we are not careful, many persons in Trinidad and Tobago will speak glibly, will say all kinds of things without possession of the facts, and therefore without knowledge of where all of these resources come from. There will be this big fight, this pulling and tugging for more resources here and more resources there. And so everybody seeking their own narrow interests, whatever those interests could be identified as, uh, speaking about more revenue for their own interests, but pay very little attention as to how we combine those revenues. And so it is instructive, indeed, important for us to discuss here this morning in a thorough manner. First of all, the resources, where they come from, who makes the contribution 
in a transparent manner. And then we will see quite clearly how those uh, resources are distributed and we will be able to determine on the basis of that distribution if in fact it is a fair distribution. But even before we do that, very important is the discussion as to who makes what contribution and if those contributions are fair enough for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Bearing in mind that at the end of the day, comrades, all of these resources, all of which we are deliberating on this morning, all of these discussions pertain to what all of us here own. The people of Trinidad and Tobago sometimes forget that the people of Trinidad and Tobago own all of these resources. And so for the man in the street, the vagrant who has no place to sleep, the sick in the hospital, the little child who was born overnight and the unborn, the elderly, all of whom, once you are a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, you own the resources of Trinidad and Tobago. And because you are in the ownership of these resources, it is your right to know what these resources are, who makes what contribution, and of course, how they are allocating these resources. But we get the sense that the population, by and large, these owners relegate to the politicians and those in the government a sort of ownership. It is as though we give them the deed. We sign over all of these resources to them and tell them to do what they want, how they want, when they want. And strange enough, they get support from their supporters to do just that. And there is nothing worse than giving a politician or a government untrammeled power and authority to do what they please. And so, even worse yet, in these difficult or challenging economic times, you have people saying, yes, they give the green light to the government. You go ahead and do this, and do that, and do the other. Even though those things have to do with removing the right, the sacred right, or rights of the, of the public. Well, this morning we want to remind all, especially the fellow, a fellow who is short on an experience and competence, not you, Goodrich. He's perhaps shorter than you and even possess even less competence to handle the portfolio that he is handling. And that is the Minister of Finance. And why am I this morning singling out for particular mention, and not special mention, eh? but for particular mention, the Minister of Finance? I'm simply singling him out because the politics the governance model that we have gives him the authority to be Minister of Finance, to be a law unto himself, to do as he please, and to share in his own image and likeness, allocate these resources as these resources are converted into revenue for the country. And so, not doing a good job as, as Minister of Finance, he found himself with a macro undertaking that is the Ministry of Energy. Now let's just think about that for a while. In a country where, which is dependent on energy resources for its revenue, it comes from the, from the energy industry. So this energy resources, energy ministry makes the money and finance spend. One arm makes it, one and the other arm spends the money. But his is an attempt, that's the Minister of Finance, to mislead the population on a number of critical issues that I would want to single out for special attention this morning the issue of the petroleum company, 
of Trinidad and Tobago and perhaps some can say for obvious reasons. But precisely for the reason of we sit in awe and look at this man peddle misinformation to the country and have the country believe that Petro Trin is a basket case and Petro Trin is not making its contribution to the national coffers and that if you follow him on that trend that the petroleum company of Trinidad and Tobago does not have the potential to do to be successful going forward what he does in our respectful view he does all of this for a reason and we want to submit this morning that what in fact the Minister of Finance, acting Minister of Energy, and sometimes even acting Prime Minister. How on earth one person could be carrying all of those portfolios? Jack of all trade, master of none, but important uh, assets he holds in his hands. How on earth he could be carrying all of those things and expected to be successful? What in heaven alone know, and perhaps God and the Prime Minister alone know. But he's not successful. If anything at all, he's trying to be successful in setting Petrochrin up for privatization. And if we are not careful and we go with the information that he is peddling, then this large pool of citizens, this global population, the, the uninformed, will readily accept the fact. In fact, you hear them say it already. Privatize a petrochrin, as if to suggest that privatizing petrochrin would be in the interest of the of the country. And you have people getting into the discussions, minus the facts. It is as though you call a jury in to in the summer, summary, summing up of a case or just before you send them into, um, into panel discussions and so on to deliberate but without the facts so the jury don't know what happened before, who was on the scene who interfered with whom, who killed who but the jury is asked to make a pronouncement but unfortunately and perhaps quite foolishly the jury that is the people of Trinidad and Tobago all of those persons who just talk, talk, talk or even worse yet, talk from a political point of view, bad for the last set and good for this set. So all the wrong that the last set was doing is good for this set to do it. So what was wrong yesterday for them in their minds is right today. But they just talk, talk, talk about Petro Trim without the facts of Petro Trim. And even worse yet, you have what we describe as those armchair, armchair, um, commentators and analysts and so on, risk, uh, risk managers, and not risk managers taking risk at all, risk managers holding their remotes and their TV and their phone and so on, scanning through all of the stations, taking half take reports and in some cases, incorrect reports, and then doing it back out to the public. I have never seen any one of them, and I want to sing with them out here this morning, a Mariano Brown, or even a Conrad Ellis, or even the past minister of, of energy, Ramna Ryan. And I don't know if the Petro Training Conference can say this morning that if you have ever seen, I have never seen, and I have been throughout the length and breadth of Petro still I have. I have never seen none of them in a, over, in a copper roll working in the refinery or in the producing field or where it matters to determine on the basis of what occurs there, what are the current facts and realities of that company. So they just talk and there's this large pool of people who just like to hear somebody say something and once it sounds good, they pedal that. But guess what? Those who want to set petrochemical up for periodization they know that it is fertile ground, that their messages will carry the misinformation and so on. We want all of us here after this morning to carry 
that an OWTU position is up. Essentially, it would be, and I'll tell you why, because the OWTU position is the correct position, the, what we put out are the facts. But what we really want you to carry is the factual position as it relates to all of these issues, particularly the petroleum company of Trinidad and Tobago. Petrochina is the most major uh, state enterprise in this country. Major state enterprise. And if we give that up to private ownership, if we give that, if we give Petrochina, put Petrochina in the hands of private interests, all of the revenue, all of the contribution that Petrochina has the potential to continue to make, and note I say continue to make, will go in the bank accounts and in the pockets of the private interest. So when they stop privatized Petrochina because they feel they are against OWTU, because OWTU is talking out against their government, which government and Minister of Finance and acting Minister of Energy is mismanaging the economy, and because we speak out against that, they say privatized Petrochina, what in fact they're doing, they're harming themselves. And the OWTU, through all of its eight years in existence, put it in, put it in, put it in struggle, will not at this point or for the next eight years allow them to put Petrochina into private hands. It will never happen. They will come and go. We will stay. And that asset must remain in the hands of the people. Because when you privatize Petrochina, you would not have the uh, revenue for education, for revenue, for the hospital, increase, um, improve health care, and so on. We are at a stage where you can't even go to one hospital, and that's the Kuba hospital. But even worse than that, we are at a, situa we are at a situation now where hospitals, the beds in the hospital are inadequate. You don't have inadequate medications in, the, in our nation's hospitals and so on. Our roads are deplorable. All of these, all of these conditions we face. But it will be worse when the private interest will declare in the face of the people of Trinidad and Tobago big profits for this company, but that profit, guess what, would not be going for the benefit of the people, for the benefit of the citizens. It will be going into the bank accounts of the private interest, and we must prevent that from happening. So if you listen to that minister, short, short on a number of things but particularly short on competence to deal with energy issues. But his attempt at making out the case for private interest for Petrochin, if you listen to him, he will have you believe that Petrochin didn't make any contribution to the state, to the citizens, to the national coffers over the last four or five years because he continues to lament Petrochin owes the government some $1.2 billion in taxes. And that is true, we are not denying that. Because Petrochin has been plagued by a lot of political interference and mismanagement and so on. And still is plagued by political interference and mismanagement and so on. Nepotism, all of which we spoke out against. All of which they, uh, they took how oh, the greatest act of reprisal against the OWTU for speaking out on these things. We will continue to do that, regardless of what they say or who is in control. But if you listen to him, you will not hear him raise those issues, but he will make Petrochin song as a basket case. A case ready, ripe for the picking of some private investor. And so he will lament the fact that Petrochin owes some 1.2 billion dollars in taxes to the government, and that is true. But what he would not say is that for the same years over which Petrochin has accrued that tax debt to the government, Petrochin would have been making significant contribution to the national economy. He does not put those figures out. And I want to this morning, for the sake of clearing the air, clarifying these issues, showing the potential that Petrochin has, despite the fact that it uh, has been and continues to be mismanaged and so on, on the basis of political interference. 
for the same corresponding period. What he is not saying is that in 2011, 2012, through and then he signed the uh, uh, TTIP, because without your initiative, I could not be putting these figures out this morning, making the case for Petrotrim's potential and for Petrotrim staying in the hands of the people. I want to thank you, you good men and women supporting this initiative that would have done the research and so on, done the reconciliation and put out these hard figures which the Minister of Finance, Acting Minister of Energy and Prime Minister Wannabe is not putting out for the public population. In 2011-2012, billion. 2012-2013, $4.2 billion. That's money Petrogen paid. 2013-2014, $6.7 billion. 2014-2015, $4 billion. A total of some $16.4 billion for the period he's lamenting that Petrogen owes what? $1.2 billion. What he is not saying is that although Petrotrin owes this money, they would have made fast contribution to the national budget, to the national coffers. And so because of the situation that Petrotrin is in now, Petrotrin is faced with an outstanding tax bill. But he's not putting that picture. He, makes, he, he gives the impression that Petrotrin didn't pay anything at all and that they owes, they owes this $1.2 uh, billion dollars to in taxes to the national treasury over the years over the yes span uh, a span of years since petrochemical has been making contribution petrochemical would have been over 60 billion dollars to this national uh, coffer that's, 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 that's what petrochemical contributed so nobody speaks about that and that that money would have been responsible for national development in very many different spheres of activities and so on. So when those persons follow the lead, the misguided lead of the uh, Minister of Finance, Finance post effort of Ministry of Energy, when they follow that lead, they go down a road as making, as if to suggest that you are making a case, not against older people, you know, you are making a case against yourselves the people of Trinidad and Tobago and your very own broad interest of, of the citizens of this country. Petrotrin has made a significant contribution and this contribution has been made despite the fact of the stranglehold of the mismanagement and the poor governance of successive management. He does not say, for instance, that it is this PNM uh, government in the past, under the past Minister of Energy, who would have engaged Petrotrin in, in an effort, in, a, in some sort of um, cosmetic effort to convert gas to liquid that is still costing the company huge amount of debt in terms of debt repayment and so on for that failed effort. And that the same union, the other bit you, would have condemned and advised strongly against that and they went into that because they what? They feel those assets belong to themselves and they can do what they want, they can experiment at the cost of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And so he does not say that up to 2010-2011, Petrotrin was owed by the government some seven billion dollars in subsidies. Let's, let's soak in that for a while. It is not that Petrotrin owed at that time, you know, it is that the government owed Petrotrin $7 billion in subsidies. Which subsidies over a period of time would have been written off against the taxes that Petrotrin would owe to the government. And so it's, the scale is on the tipping on the other side now, but he makes that point without making the essential point about the contribution and the potential that this company has. I'm going to say just a couple of things on this issue before I close. We have recommended on numerous occasions for this very important public, the restructuring 
of the company to allow the company to be more efficient, to allow the company to be more effective in terms of realizing its fullest potential. Because our position is that Petrochin must not rely on the price of oil to be successful. Petrochin can be successful notwithstanding the fall in the price of oil and commodity and so on. But Petrochin needs to be led properly and managed properly by competent persons who are patriotic to this, to this country. What you had instead, and you continue to have, is a set of vultures and so on coming and taking from that entity for themselves and in their own narrow and most times political interest. It has the potential. And wait not for, guess what, and guess who? Wait not for the workers. Today, you would have had no petrol trade. It is only on the basis of the very set workers of the company, you still have a company that was kept whole to be able to be reorganized at this point, despite the fact of all of, of those things that occurred. And our position is that the company must be restructured, it must be void of political interference, and it must be allowed to soar. It must be allowed to reach the highest height it can possibly get so that all of the people of Trinidad and Tobago can benefit from this country and from this company is being organized in a proper and efficient manner. That is the old of this EU's position. So if in this reorganization, people in the top management are given marching orders, we have no problem with that. Let me just say that again. If in this reorganization, we determine that we have too many vice presidents, or we have too many top managers, because the company is top heavy, because they would have, at the expense of filling vacancies at the lower level, at the core where it matters, in the refinery where you need operators, offshore where you need workers, in the refinery where you need skill and competent craftsmen, and so on, in the fields where you need workers, instead of filling all of those vacancies, they would have gone and neglected that and created positions at the top. And if at all, Petrochin is top heavy, Something you would not hear those commentators talking about, those armchair um, commentators. They wouldn't mention that. They would go after the lowest level workers. Our position is that for a successful petrochip, fill all of those vacancies at the operational and technical level. Our position is that if it comes to a point where you have to get rid of those managers, we will support getting rid of persons who are not in the interest of the company and therefore not in the interest of the country. We have absolutely no problem with that. And so we are saying this morning that we are going to do all that is necessary to ensure that this company remains in the hands of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Petrotrin will not be privatized as long as there is an OWTU. And you can hear and you can see by the way of the introduction by the chairman of Malawi this morning that we are 80 years old and we prepare to be another 80 and another 80 with companies like Petrotrin in the hands of the people. And so it is important, comrade, it was important for me to spend a little time this morning for you to just in one particular area of this energy sector where resources are extracted to focus on the potential that the company has. I think that we are on a good uh, road. We talk about the issue of uh, accountability, but accountability cannot be completed unless you have transparency. You ought to be transparent in all of your dealings. And you cannot condemn those before for not being transparent. And now you yourself are not being transparent by the peddling of misinformation. So transparency is critical for accountability and for development and so on. And of course, in any event, we were taught from small that honesty is the best policy. And of course, this transparency of our folks teaching us when they talk about honesty and so on, and honesty being the best, the best quality. So, 
finally, I want to say that quite apart from our struggle to ensure that these assets remain in the hands of the people, we must also endeavor to struggle to ensure that the mechanism by which we are getting these information, which information will put us in an informed position, a position to take the decision to struggle. Because if you struggle, you must know what you're struggling for. But that the mechanism, the initiative to uh, allow us to get the information, to be able to struggle for what is ours, this ETE, ITI, Transparency uh, Initiative, we must struggle to ensure that it remains in the hands of the people and that it continues to function, that we will continue to get the information that we are going to discuss. Thank you very much for coming. I welcome you. And uh, let's have our discussion here. Thank you very much, Comrade Ansel George Roche, Roche, President General of the OWTU and President of Joint Trade Union Movement, bringing welcome remarks. I don't want to spend too much time, but I just want to reiterate two very important things that would have been highlighted in that welcoming remarks. One, that it is clear that on the basis of the significant contribution that Petrotrin has been making to the country that we, the OWTU, supported by our comrades of the Joint Trade Union Movement, say no to the privatization of the petroleum company of Trinidad and Tobago. And that we will do all that is necessary, all such other things, so that that important asset remains in the hands of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I think that is a very clear message coming from your welcoming remarks. Moving straight ahead, having of course, during your opening remarks, down the TTEITI initiative itself for enabling us to have the information and the facts and the real data to be able to counter the misinformation and the, or the manipulation of information by politicians. We are pleased to have in these halls, once again, a brother, and we call him a comrade, that is Comrade Victor Hart, who is the chair of the TTEITI, championing ch transparency from since the beginning. And he has always advanced the importance of having an EITI initiative in Trinidad and Tobago, and we have one. But what is important is that he's a chair that comes from the civil society sector, he himself being a former a pre president or chairman of the Transparency Institute here in Trinidad and Tobago, having been recognized internationally now as a champion for transparency, he now sits on the executive board of TTEITI International. Please join me in welcoming this brother and of course comrade, Victor Hart, to bring introductory remarks on behalf of TTEITI. Thank you very much, uh,
felt. I lived in San Bernardo, a protest area at the Presentation College. As well, it was great to see a few of the students from my school at San Bernardo Market here. And, uh, and I spent many, many years as a teenager in Point Fortin, in the heart of the oil industry where my father moved to UBOT Shell. And I grew to love the oil industry over the years. Because after leaving college, I, I next moved to Point of Air Refinery, first as a student apprentice and then as a refinery operator. I, I, I grew to love the pungent, the pungent smell of crude oil. The San Fernandians as a whole hated But it, it, it was perfumed to me because that, that, that lovely smell that you go to the, the light when, when you work in the refinery and uh, uh, live. Day by day, uh, with, with the oil and the gases in the air uh, and so on around you. So, I saw the energy sector, however, as media provider of jobs for my father, for myself, and, and others who, who were lucky. Not once did I ever think over those years, even as I worked in the energy sector, that the energy sector and natural resources belong to me and the people of Trinidad and Vigo. Our bosses were foreigners and I always saw this as just an opportunity for employment and for some revenues to the state. Never had a clue how much money the state really owned from the energy sector. Uh, because in those days we didn't have the benefit of the EIKI report, which we will be hearing about it, which exposes these important details to you, the owners of the natural resources uh, of, of this country. The problem with promoting ownership of the EIK of the energy resources is difficult to find too because there's so much dissatisfaction now um, among citizens with the way our country is governed, all the views of government and, and commons, that um, people seem not receptive enough to facing up to the fact that the resources are theirs, they have a right to know how much money is being generated, and to stand up uh, and plan accountability and transparency from the government and, and the companies. In this mood that we have in the, the country, there's great disenchantment, and that is, we find it making it difficult to get our message across. But we have to see there's an opportunity to keep hammering uh, that message, despite the fact, as Comrade um, Hansen said, there's such negative in, in the news about petrol fuel, not paying taxes, owing so much or the front page story in the Sunday Express about the methanol plant uh, exposed to a, a US $385 million claim for the breach of contract with bad gas. So there's a lot of negativity uh, in, in the, about the energy sector in, in the public domain. But at this time, I'm heartened to say that the EIPI produces good news about the energy the EIPI is based on the assumption and the knowledge and the certainty that the natural resources of Trinidad and the Lego belong to us, the people. And that gives us an inalienable right to the information on how the, the, those natural resources are exploited, the revenues generated, and how the revenues are spent in our name. So the EIPI is about protecting the people's patrimony. It's also about protecting the inheritance of these young uh, people who are still at uh, college. It's going to pay our pensions, the older ones among us. It's going to pay for their, the younger ones' education. It's going to pay for, for the health um, preservation of, of, of all of us. So the EITI is good news. The EITI is something that we should take personally because it's affecting you, affecting me as individuals. It's quite apart from the fact that you are members of the team, the major energy sector 
Austria Union, as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, you have to recognize that the EIDI is all protecting your inheritance, your patrimony, and you should take it personally and get to know more about it as you do. Um, protected if necessary, um, because the EITI is a greater service than the Trinidad and Tobago now. It could come under threat. You could find that with a change of government, uh, a, a new administration might feel that it is not disposed to the amount of transparency and accountability demanded by the EITI. And as we've seen in other countries in the world, the future of the EITI in Trinidad and Tobago could come under threat. And if so, I would expect all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, particularly uh, a civil society organization like the, the trade union, the OWG or other trade unions to stand up for protecting the EIDI and saying it belongs to us, the people, and not to the government. And stand up as much as it ever comes to that. The EIDI is a voluntary coalition and you will hear more about it from the Norman. A coalition between the government that manages the resources on our behalf, not the government that owns the resources and can do with it whatever they like, as government as uh, that they are sometimes presumed that to do. Second, members of the coalition are the companies that invest in the energy sector, hopefully to make a profit, and, and, and they do. And the third element of the coalition is civil society representing us, the people who own the natural resources. On the steering committee, we are privileged to have the ODWD as a member. And the ODWD has been a member from day one as part of the civil society uh, constituency on the energy uh, on, on the steering committee. And we have been lucky to have had Ozzy Warwick as our member for the past seven years from day one. And currently it's ordinate is, is Candice Seabrook. And the OWD has made a powerful contribution to the work of the EITI and our success really is a large part due to the support and input you we receive from, from the OWD. And I thank you and I, I, I hope that I will continue. In conclusion, let me say that um, the EITI it's a worldwide organization. And some of you may not have heard of it. It's based in Oslo, Norway, the headquarters of 51 countries throughout the world um, that are members. We want you to do it in the United States. So it's, it's not something that um, is singular to us, um, but it is growing in strength. And as Ozzy said, uh, I, I now sit on the international board and I'm able to help using our Trinidad and Tobago experience and how the EIDI is being implemented in, in many, in many uh, foreign countries. To give an example, on the EIDI board, I represent uh, a region, it's called Region 6 of the EIDI, and Region 6 comprises Albania, Norway, England, Germany, and Europe, and in the Americas, USA, Peru, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, Dominican Republic, and Trinidad and Tobago. So little Trinidad and Tobago has a seat on the international board in the United States of the We appreciate you giving us this opportunity to share the good news of the EITI with you. And we hope that uh, you will leave here understanding the initiative better, seeing it's important to you as individuals, as citizens, and uh, you as a, a union, and that you will take the message to your friends, family, because the more people who know about the EITI, the more support you will get if, 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 if ever it, if it comes under threat. I hope the students from St. Mary's College, I mean from, <laughs> uh, from Presentation College, my apologies, that, that's good on the problem because our full presentation I ended up at St. Mary's. <laughs> uh, and uh, take the, the reports that you got, share it with people, 
with your teacher and let them have a look. The full report is on your website and you get us some reading if you want to do it for the teenagers. And uh, I hope you will participate in, in, in the session to follow by going to the right to home, asking your questions, seeking clarification on all of the points uh, that you make from the top. So thank you very much for having us here. And I hope you will find our uh, message to the supporters and uh, we will continue to, to, to work in support of the EIPI and the citizens of the Thank you. Thank you very much, our friend, uh, brother, and comrade Victor Hart, for his introductory remarks. And let me just say, comrade Hart, it would have been mentioned to you at a TTEITI meeting. But I think you can feel rest assured that we will not, as the Oil Free Workers Trade Union and as, a, and as a progressive trade union movement, we would not allow any government or politician to shut down TTEITI. And if there's one thing we know, we know how to march. We know how to march. And it was. The next presentation, as we were sitting there, and as you mentioned, presentation college and the importance of them sharing the information. President General just whispered, it is important to understand the report. Because we don't want, we want comrades to be, and our students, to be able to go away with a complete in-depth understanding of the report and why the report is so important and why we will struggle to ensure that this process and this initiative continue. And to do that, I want to bring the head of the ETTEITI Secretariat. And that is, well, he has been working his way towards the acclamation of Comrade. He's still, he's still working his way up, but he's getting closer and closer. This is about his second or third appearance here at the Paramount Building. And, um, but, but we, we, yeah, he's a, he, you get it next time. You graduated, you graduated today. So let us um, have Shoen Long, head of the EITI Secretariat, and has really been ensuring that the day to day operations of the TITI continue. And let him now take us through the actual report. Please join him when he Come on, show him now. Take it, only wire, I guess. All right. Uh, good morning. All protocols observed. It's our pleasure to be here with you to share some details of the EITI report. Again, uh, this is the fourth public policy forum, and this is chiseled into our calendar now. Every year we come uh, to this building to share the, the news of, of the report with you. Next slide. Next slide. Today I will just outline a, a few details of the report, but before that I'll give you an introduction to the EITI, what, what, what exactly the initiative is about, uh, highlight some of the benefits and uses of the data, uh, give you details of our latest report, which covers our fiscal years 2014 and 15, as well as highlight what's next for us and, and how the EITI is part of the, 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 the promotion of Trinidad and Tobago as a brand. So, what is the EITI? Again, the EITI is a global standard for resource revenue transparency. Uh, think of it as an ISO standard. Uh, basically, it promotes publishing of data, uh, companies disclosing what they pay to governments, governments disclosing what they receive. Um, it is an international coalition, as Victor said. We are governed by an international standard that we have to meet. Uh, it's a tripartite coalition of government, civil society, and companies where you get collective governance. None of the decisions that we take uh, are done willingly. There must be buy-in by all of the partners for, for all work to go on. I think it's, all, it's good to mention that in a country like Trinidad and Tobago, where there's division, that competing interests can sit together at a table and come together and, and agree on a way forward for, 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 for EITI implementation, which is linked to the country's revenue and, and, and our natural resources. But there's voluntary participation in, in the EITI as well. Uh, companies will indeed provide their data. Uh, 
Victor, who is before that, you have 51 countries across the world participating. So that and today, when we have compliant country status, which is the highest level of membership, we go from candidate country to compliant country status. And it, it, it means uh, this is linked to you satisfying the EITI requirements, which is a standard, uh, meaning that you have to provide information. We go all the way from your license, your registers, is there public access to your license? Uh, how is your production monitor? How is it verified? Uh, how is the, what taxes do you cover in your report? What taxes are important? How much companies pay in the area in regards to these taxes? And even if it goes beyond that, to how you allocate the, 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 the revenue that you earn to, to, to manage your country. And then the EITI process is very simple. Companies will disclose to us what they pay to the government. The government will disclose what they receive. An independent, and this is important, an independent audit firm is hired to reconcile the difference between what companies say they pay to the government versus what governments say they pay to receive from companies. If there's a difference with those figures, then the auditor, which is an independent body, will highlight the difference and explain what is the reason for those differences. So some of the benefits of, of the DITI data, again, for different stakeholders, you have different benefits. A government will sign up to the DITI initiative because it helps increase revenue and helps reform government systems and processes. For instance, uh, you will, if, you're, if you, can, you can capture leakage through the findings of, of the report, the report also recommends ways in which the government can improve its own audit and assurance processes. So whether it's linked to the Auditor General, whether it's linked to the Ministry of Energy, and how the Ministry of Energy manages uh, its data, how it collects its revenue. Those are, uh, those are some of the reasons why our, our, our government will sign up for the initiative. Again, it's also linked to the branding of the country. You know, credit rating agencies look at governance indicators and so on, and the EITI, participation in the EITI, is, is one of those uh, governance indicators. For a company, again, a company, if it grants you social license, so you build trust with local communities where you operate. So a, co a company will disclose its revenue payments to the government, to build trust with local communities. So well, listen, this is what we pay to the government of your country, and we want to disclose this. Again, it also mitigates against reputational risks. It's a disincentive to corruption with, 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 for companies as well. If all of us report to this standard, then there's, there's little room for cowboys and, uh, and, and so on in the neighbor. The civil society is very important because it provides data, independently verified data. You know, in Trinidad and Tobago, there's an issue with, with us having data and how you verify. But this is independently verified data by an auditor. So, so, so the, the, the data, there's some veracity to the data. Uh, and it, 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 this data allows more participatory, it allows a participatory democracy where people can look at data and have discussions on important issues around the energy sector. This slide here just shows you some of the members of the steering committee. You can see it's a diverse cast. Uh, the government is represented by the Ministry of Energy, uh, Petrotrin, National Gas Company, National Quarries, are state energy companies. You have the Board of Inland Revenue as well as the Ministry of Finance. You have some of the larger companies represented on the board as well, whether it's BHP, Billiton, DP, Shell, uh, the Chambers of Commerce, some of the civil society side to create that balance. You have the OWTU, you will have the Shimon and Friends of the Sea, you have the, the Network of NGOs for the Advancement of Women, you will have our Trinidad and Tobago Transparency Institute, and for Shimon and Friends of the Sea as well as the Proper Foundation. Uh, so you see, uh, and no decision made by the steering committee can be made without the participation and, and, and each partner must have an equal voice. So I think it's a, it's a, just for that alone, in terms of collective governance, it shows, it shows the country that competing interests can sit together on the table and come to agreement on, on an important issue which is linked to, your, to, to the energy sector. Some of the uses of the data, again, I, also, I always use the R word in terms of reform, uh, the EITI will, will provide recommendations on how you can improve your revenue collection, how you can improve your audits, 
of, of, of your revenue, whether it's through your Auditor General, whether it's through your Finance, your Board of Inland Revenue, or your Ministry of, of, of Energy. Uh, it provides data for independent analysts to do their work. Uh, audit firms, order audit firms, the PwCs, etc., will review the contents of the report. Uh, the gas master plan consultants also use the data from our report to, to, to guide their policy prescriptions for the country. Uh, the important thing with the data as well is that it's not available in any other place. Uh, the Income Tax Act forbids disclosure of certain types of, 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 of revenue. Well, it forbids disclosure of, uh, from the Board of Inland Revenue or, 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 or company data. When the companies sign up to this initiative, they send letters of consent to the, to the Board of Inland Revenue and the Ministry of Energy, uh, and that allows us to, to share the data with the public as well. So it's unprecedented. You will not get this data anywhere. Uh, it helps provide data for, for, for negotiation between trade unions and government. Uh, what was important for us is that during the, 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 the recent impasse, uh, the OWT and the Petrochem use the EITI data because it's independently verified. I will help you make positions or, or, or take a stance on certain things, show you this is the actual revenue that the country collects. Uh, we want that type of use of the data. We promote that type of use of the data. Again, it also the data also gives fence line communities information. Our companies working in my area, uh, what do they pay to the government? Then you ask questions on what does it mean for my health center, my rules, etc. So I can know what exactly a company pays to the government and how that is linked to my life as a citizen. So I think that's very important. So I highlight a few of the uh, a few findings of the the the, the, the sub report. Again, what we do is we capture, we have information from over 45 companies. Uh, this year we included the mining sector for the first time uh, in our pilot. Uh, we highlight the different taxes that the government pulls from the, from the energy sector, broken down so you can go to our report and see what a company pays in, in, in terms of petroleum profit tax, what they pay in, in, in SBT, which is linked to oil prices. You can see what the state companies pay in dividends. You can see what a company pays in terms of its CSR spending, its infrastructure. What if, for example, a company builds a road network? That is also that that information is also included in our report. And most importantly, uh, recommendations for how this the country can improve how it collects its collects its revenue as well as it improves its earnings. So. This report covers two years. In 2014, we saw that there was a $147 million difference between what the company said they paid to the government versus what the government said they received from the company. Right? Uh, right. When we, when we reconcile our auditor, we reconcile the, difference, the differences. What we, what we found was that foreign exchange differences, as well as timing differences, are complete for the, for the, for the bulk of the, for the, bulk of the differences. Uh, Timing differences, of course, a company may deposit, may we send a, a payment through to the Ministry or to the Board of Inland Revenue on the 28th of September. It's only registered in October, on October 5th. That payment actually goes into a new financial year. So that's the reason for the uh, timing difference. Uh, again, that was the, the major reason for, for differences. What is very important as well, and I want you to take note of, there is no unidentified receipts. So every single payment we see, Every single payment transfer, the, the auditor found evidence for it, right? And so it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious exercise where the auditor has to get that data from both the government and the company to ensure that that that, is, that, that the figures are reconciled. So there's no unidentified differences. All of the differences are counted. 2015, we also saw that there was less of a, a, a difference, not about the 50 million dollar difference. And again, the reasons for that would have been linked to, to timing differences uh, and, and for an actual fluctuation are pumping to the bulk of, of the differences. Okay, you can see the trend there over the years of our reports. We reported from the 2010 to 2011 fiscal period to 2014 15. You can see trends in, 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 in revenue. Uh, you can see declines, so it tells a picture, it paints a picture of what the country is going through in terms of energy revenue, where we are. You will see that uh, the red bar shows dividend payments, and you will have seen dividend payments increase exponentially.
exponentially over, over uh, the, the five-year period of our reporting. Again, it's also it can also the data can also send send signals about how much money we collect based on prices. Uh, supplemental petroleum tax (XPT) is linked to the price of oil. For instance, if oil prices are below fifty dollars, the country companies don't have to pay SPT. So, it, so it can show you the data can show you okay. If in a particular year prices are low, what can we expect to get from SPT? So you can see some trends in terms of what we can get. Uh, between 2011 and 2015, we have collected just under $19 billion in, 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 in supplemental petroleum tax. Prices average around $17 in that period. We know in 2016, prices average $43, and this year prices average $53. So you can send signals in terms of what, how much revenue you can actually get from the, from the sector based on prices. Again, it shows company payments. I'd like to make a note of, 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 of this as well. You will see the NGC. In the first year of reporting, the was the highest tax payer. Uh, this year's report shows that NGC is the, the, the highest tax payer. Again, this is linked to the dividend payment, payments made to the government. Uh, Petro Trade has also contributed uh, approximately $21 billion in revenue to the state over our reporting period between 2011 and 2010, sorry, 2015. So you can see state enterprises contribution to government, to government revenue as well. But some of the reasons for the fluctuations, the changes in, 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 in how much we earn from the sector is linked to price declines. Of course, we are price takers, so the global price of these commodities decline and it impacts on our revenue. We are also, uh, the production is also linked to, to, to how much revenue we earn from, from the sector. And the fiscal regime framework, you know, you would not get an investment into your country to, to if, if there is not amendments or changes to your fiscal system, the tax structures and so on for companies. Then there's also the issue of the terms and conditions of contracts. Companies may be able to write off uh, some of some of the expenditure and you'll get less taxes in that financial year because of that. And that's something that we will be seeing. Uh, you see in the future as well when it changes to the fiscal regime kicks in for companies like say, right? Again, this report for the first time we've done some analysis on the production share contracts. Uh, one of the questions that, that citizens ask is, are we getting what we're supposed to get from the energy sector? Uh, we don't have contract transparency in Trinidad today, but where you can see the contracts. Now, what, this year, what we have done, the ministry has provided us with. What are the obligations of the production sharing contracts? What are the company obligations versus what they pay? You know, so I think that is a very important uh, new set of information because it starts to answer, not fully, but it starts to answer the question of are we getting what we're supposed to get from the from, from our energy resources which belong to all of us. Uh, in terms of the production sharing contracts, the production share profit, uh, you can compare that to what the government Pays to the ministry, pays to its partners, uh, pays, sorry, pays to the border billion revenue on behalf of its partners. And then you ask yourself the question are, we, are, are these production sharing contracts a good deal for the country? I highlighted the issue with dividend payments uh, already. You will see overlapping the period of a report, only the NGC has paid dividends apart from NP. We will report on NP. We plan to bring them in when uh, we cover marketing companies. Uh, so you have seen the rise from 350 million in 2011 to 5 billion dollars, just under 6 billion in 2015. Um, that's important. The NGC is a state company, um, and, 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 and so you have to keep a track of all of its payments as well. Social payments. We've seen uh, what do companies spend on CSR. What do they spend on infrastructure payments as well? Whether they pay, 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 pay for road, etc. In, in that community, um, what we've seen is if you look at the, the bar for NGC, NGC's CSR payments have cut of double over, over uh, the period of our reporting. Again, as a state company, you ask questions about the NGC. Um, also, you will have even ask questions on whether or not companies pay enough in spend enough in CSR. Uh, who would get some people to make those influences or ask us. This can be included in the mining sector. Of course, it's the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. So 
previously we need to do the oil and gas sector, but we felt that you know, since the mining sector is important for us to, to cover, so we did a pilot. We requested 10 companies participate in the, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the ITI reporting, 10 mining companies, only four responded to our calls. Again, this is a voluntary initiative. Um, so the four companies were, we had a publicly traded company in Trinidad Cement Limited, we had our two state companies, the Ashford and National Quarries, and we had a, a private company, the Limitage Limestone, and then these are pioneers. What we found is that it's, it's not difficult for companies to report to the EIT, and it sends a good signal, um, that's the feedback we see. The differences um, was simply 300,000. Uh, that was basically linked to outstanding receipts by the national courts. Again, our report contains information on, on what the country sees from court operators as well. So from this table, you can see what, what the board of the have been collected in terms of corporation tax from the EV. This uh, chart is important because it shows you, um, this is Ministry of Finance data, it shows that between 2003, and this is projected to 2017, uh, is the country will receive $24 million. And I repeat that figure, $24 million between 2003 and projected up to 2017. You can ask yourself, um, during this period there was a construction boom, there was a development of highways, you can ask yourself if these royalty payments are enough. And, 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 and so it's a fair question to ask. Again, some of the report innovations include us highlighting the beneficial owners of the companies that invest in the, in, the, in, the, in the oil and gas sector. When I say beneficial owners, I speak directly to the, the real owners, okay? Sherwin and Ozzy Incorporated, we are, the, we are the owners behind the company. We will be listed as the beneficial owners. Uh, we will put it in the names of our wives, uh, so there will be transparency around who actually owns the companies. And we have a register on our website. It's the first beneficial ownership register in the, in the country where we where we show that information. Who are the real owners behind the companies that invest in the in, in, in your in your national who invest in the in, in the industry. Again, the government has also committed to have a national beneficial ownership register. So, so the work of the, the, the EITI does is also is also linked to, to, to overall reforms of how we how we capture needs on company ownership, etc. We also are include environmental reporting for the first time in the new report, highlighting the number of CEC applications. We find this pain due to spills, whether or not there was an environmental disaster and so on. Um, in, in the years in which we've covered, uh, we've seen that between our reporting period of the 530 CC applications, only three were refused. So the data, you know, it forces you to ask questions, it provides you with the data. We also uh, did analysis of the production sharing contracts, as I said before, to determine whether or not we see what are the obligations of companies and whether or not they are actually pay this, these obligations. We also uh, highlighted. Uh, that there's a, 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 a delay in audits of these production sharing contracts, which is key. Uh, it's a key revenue management issue. Uh, uh, an audit can tell you whether or not you're getting what you're supposed to get from these from the companies, uh, whether or not they've been meeting their financial obligations as well. But we highlighted there are 249 expenditure and 18 revenue audits that are outstanding. Uh, some of when we highlighted this data, the Ministry has taken steps as well to, to reduce this backlog by hiring more staff in the production sharing contract quality. Some of the report recommendations, again, the reform is key. In terms of audit and assurance, our report is disclosed that the Auditor General does not audit to international standards. Our first report highlighted that. Since then, the Auditor General, uh, in fact, Department has taken steps to create its staff to boost up the competency, and so that's one of the recommendations of the report that the Auditor General has actually taken actions on. Again, the administrator, the auditor of the report, highlighted that there's need for greater monitoring of the production sharing contracts, and companies should also provide more verification in terms of a letter from their external auditor 
confirming the information submitted is consistent with their quality financial statements on the global level. In terms of public disclosure, again, getting the data for these reports is not an easy process because of the Income Tax Act. Uh, even the Auditor General, which is the country's accountant, does not access the Board of Inland Revenue data because of the Income Tax Act. So these issues are, are important for us to follow up on. These are important reform issues uh, where legislative change is necessary to give the Auditor General, as well as the TTDITI Auditor, access to this information fully. Uh, again, there's issues around in-kind payments. Uh, if the country gets gas in kind instead of actual payments from companies that goes to the agency. How we report on that is also an also, also issue based on the report. Um, as well as things around, as well as issues around how the ministry captures its data and publishes its data, whether you have access to all the license register, license, to the license register. Can I go on the web on a website and see all of the things that are built, all of the things that actually have the blocks uh, and develop the blocks? that 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 licensed operators have to pay royalties, you know, um, where if you're licensed, you have to pay a rehabilitation fund. So if, you're, if you have a mining license, you pay a rehabilitation fund. This is set aside so that if there's environmental degradation, you use this 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 fund to, to rehabilitate your quarry acreage or, or, or so on when you're finished. All of these things are linked to a proper licensing procedure. So without a proper licensing procedure, without have, making a clear process, it, 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 it cuts back on not only revenue, but it also impacts on, on issues around the environment and so on. Uh, there needs to be an independent verification of mining, mining production from quarries and, and, and the actual process. Because your royalty payments is linked to your production. Currently, there's no independent verification system. So if I, if I have a, a, a quarry, uh, the ministry will come to me and ask me how much I produce. Right, and you will have to take my word for it because there's no independent system where there's a way bridge in a, in, a, in a particular geographic region to, to capture how much is actually produced. So that's just, those are serious issues as well. Okay, what's next for us in terms of making the EITI codified in law? Uh, we developed EITI legislation that gives the EITI, makes the EITI agency and this is an independent authority, as well as making EITI disclosure mandatory. So any com company that operates in Trinidad and Tobago will have to fall under, under the, the, the EITI and report to us what they pay to the government in terms of our taxes and we will be concerned. I think currently uh, we are, there's voluntary participation and we capture around 90% of the, of, the, of the companies that pay taxes to the government. But it's also good to have this as a mandatory, a mandatory requirement for any company that is coming to, to the country to invest. Again, we also are, we are different uh, new advancements in the EITI. We are trying to bring, because Trinidad Trinidad to be uh, we have an integrated value chain. We have, we currently report on only the upstream side, only the, the exploration and production side. But of course, you know, there's, there's the refineries, there's, there's the Atlantic LG, a terminal, the stream operators, Phoenix Park, then you have the downstream plants and producers that also pay taxes to the people. And we want to include them as well as we have a the discussion in bringing them into the, into the EITI family. Again, commodity trading is a, it's a new issue in the, the EITI report uh, where a technical group is looking at what does the, the first trade, when I say first trade, uh, in many instances the NGC or petrochemical will, 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 sell, will sell product to a trading commodity company, that is a traffic world, that company will then sell it to, 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 to another, uh, they, they may market it to another, another jurisdiction and so on. So when you have that commodity trading reporting, 
it means that the, the, the state companies will report on the value, not just the value, not just the volume, how much the product they sell to these companies, but the actual value. And it's a good exercise because it will help you, it will help you get data around the situation, the chance of pricing and so on. I'm cognizant of time, so I will, I, will, I will move on very quickly. I'll just say that the, the EITI is, is linked to our country branding. You know? How do we, how, how we really stand out in the city in the seas? Corruption, perception, ease of doing business. What does our, what, what does the US government score as an indicator say about your country? Again, the EITI is a beacon. Uh, in transit, we only know that uh, the things in the corruption perception index, our scores and our ratings have been having declining. Uh, and but the EIT also shows that we can get something right in terms of transparency and good and, and governance. Um, more and more investors are looking to countries where they are, they are good indicators around governance to invest in. I think we need the EITI again it, 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 it provides hope and it's it. It shows that the country can also adhere to global transparency standards, right? Uh, in closing, I want to say that we've learned a lot of lessons from the EITI, implement, from the EITI implementation in Trinidad and Tobago. What we've seen is that there are deficiencies in the way the government collects its revenue and collects its revenue. Uh, there's also a, a, a lag in up-to-date auditing. Uh, and it impacts on revenue because it's linked to the production sharing contracts. Uh, we've seen some improvement in government revenue collect revenue reporting as well uh, for the initiative. Uh, and importantly, you know, we want to say that we, there's a lot of work that we do in terms of analysis behind the scenes to show how if you, if you make these changes, you can increase your revenue. I think at a time when the country is in a revenue crunch, you know, uh, that is important as, as well. Uh, and importantly, I want to say finally, is that the EITI shows that there can be collective governance, that different competing interests can come together, sit on the table, sit on the same board, and agree on our way forward in regards to the energy sector, revenue management, uh, revenue transparency for the country as well. And it provides you with data. I think all citizens here, you know, when you take an actual, the taller says take it personally, uh, and I want to reiterate that. Again, it's independently verified data, so, it's, so, it's, so, it's, so you, can, you can trust the data. Uh, again, the, these energy resources impact on how much you pay for gas for your cars, how much you pay for gas for cooking. Uh, it, it's linked to your, your pension when you retire as well. You can pay your pension. What is the heritage and stabilization fund of features and generation? So I really want you to take it personally and, and we look forward to, to, to your questions in the QD uh, session as well. Thanks again for your attention. Thank you very much. Very much um, graduating and earning. And let me just say, that, that word comrade means a lot to us. You have to earn that and keep that. So we hope that in future forums and in future endeavors, you'll, you'll continue to maintain that important title of comrade, showing long for sharing with us in detail um, some more information and very important information. And I just want to, let us just give another round of applause for this contribution. And there's just a, two, a few things I want to highlight. Um, President General was mentioning to me there that there's, there's two key highlights that we want to really emphasize. And one has to do with this question of production sharing contracts. We don't, I don't want us to have that fly over our heads. And let us be clear what that is. These are contracts between government and multinationals. And believe it or not, there are no laws that, is, that provide for us as people of Trinidad and Tobago to know exactly what are in those contracts. I think we want to set a clear statement here this morning that we want to see more transparency with regards to production sharing contracts. We want to know how much we're how much we supposed to be getting for our resources. And the second one has to do with this question of transfer pricing, where you undervalue, sell it to yourself somewhere else, and then sell it back on the international market. You know who was doing that? Arcelor Mittal. 
Asala Mita was doing that. And we, are, we only can guess how many others are engaging in transfer pricing. But as citizens, I think this is another area that we need to call out more on. We need to see stronger measures being taken to deal with transfer pricing so that we, the, the people of Trinidad and Tobago get truly what is ours. Comrades, you have a report. Everybody, everybody got a copy, right? Anybody didn't get a copy? Yeah? I guess because sometimes you have a tool, like you could be walking on the road and someone give you a tool, give you a hammer, but if you don't use the tool, I'm still talking about a hammer, then you can have a problem. So it's very important that we understand the tool that we have. So I just want to very quickly, before we go to the next two presentations, take us through very quickly the tool. And this time I'm talking about the report. Page, you all not easy enough. Page two quickly tells us and gives us over a summary, page two, in terms of oil production, crude oil production, average and gas production. And what, what should stand out immediately is something that the OWT have been saying for years. As a matter of fact, I remember on the Labor Day platform of 20, 20, 2010, we were warning about the fall in production of oil and gas. And now we have it here, page two, stated crude oil production went from 81,262 barrels per day to 78,656. Now when you have a fall in the production of, of oil, this is overall. And I believe President General was saying that petrochemical comes about half of that, about less than half, about 30 something thousand. Now obviously for every barrel of oil, now this is per day, so you see how much revenue we are losing. And this is why it's so important for us to hold politicians and hold the managers and owners of these state assets to account. Because we lose if we don't monitor this fall in production. So page two gives you very clear. So when you hear or you read some of the commentators, and I'm sure commentators as you say, pull your report, pull your tool, the report. And you can see for yourself what they're talking about or what misinformation they share. Page three quickly gives you an idea from, us, from 2011 to 2015 in terms of the contribution the energy sector makes. It also talks about the natural gas production and of course petrochemical exports in terms of ammonia and methanol. That's page three. Page four gives us an idea of the crude oil and gas reserves. Ryder Scott audit. I know that it have some so-called energy experts who have been writing uh, a lot in the newspapers in terms of oil and gas reserves. Now, comrades, the reason why we wanted to spend a little time bringing you, uh, drawing your attention to this information. One of the key ways in which politicians and the elite class continue to do what they do or feel that they can do what they want is because they feel that we don't understand what we do. Once we understand, not only understand, but internalize that what they are doing is interfering with our future and our heritage, then we hold them to greater account, including coming from students. When you can say, but wait, in terms of resources to my school, resources for the teachers, and I see a teacher here, and of course we always make a plug for the worker teachers to ensure that you're properly remunerated and that your terms and conditions are up to standard. It is because that is coming from the resources, the production in the energy sector. So it cannot be that this important sector contributed to the national economy that is ensuring my development and that I don't know what's going on and I'm not holding anybody to account. That cannot continue. Page 5 gives us an idea of what the onshore upstream activities are. So you actually can see here in this page 5 where the blocks are allocated and who owns which block. And of course, of importance is the next one, the offshore of stream activity map 2016, in terms of which multinational own which block. We even have Trinity, we'll see Trinity exploration. So you can know exactly who owns which block, both onshore and offshore. The Heritage Stabilization Fund, we hear a lot about it on page six. But here's what is interesting, and this is why these TTITI reports are important. Did you realize that? and it's right here, between 2010, 
2010, 2011, 2011, 2012, 2012, 2013, that the percentage of oil revenue deposits actually have been shrinking, even though the oil price was the same. I want commerce to pay attention to that. To the point that in 2013, 2014, when oil price was still $93, 0%. I want us to take note. And then the next one, everybody likes to talk about fuel subsidies. No, but people don't really understand how it works. So this graph gives a very good picture as to how the petrol, petroleum fuel subsidy works. And let me just say, and I think we've said it several times um, at this forum and at other forums and wherever we can on this issue of the subsidies, to make it clear that the subsidies is not just about economics. It's not just about bottom line. It's not just about numerical value. There is a philosophical principle about the subsidy, meaning it is the only mechanism by which every single citizen, every single citizen can benefit from the natural resources of the country. The only mechanism. And therefore, so long as there are no other mechanisms to, to distribute that value in terms of the natural resources of the country, we will always say, leave the subsidy alone. Then page, why are we not sure about it? Leave the subsidy alone on the basis of a principal position that all citizens have to benefit from the resources. Page seven and eight gives a nice breakdown. This is the table. So in case you think the numbers are we making up the numbers. Table seven and eight, well, pages seven and eight gives you a table of the 2013 to 2014 analysis by companies. From, and it's in alphabetical order. And I think one thing will surprise you is that you still see that Moco, right? So you got rid of them. So you have Amoco, BP, BG, BHP, Militant, Chevron. And one of the things that jumped out at you, and I think we said that when we first did this forum, is the, um, the, the continuation of the amount of foreign um, interests that are involved in our energy sector. But it goes down and you see Petrochem Group um, straight down to Trinity Exploration. Page 9 and 10 gives you the 2014 to 2015 period. And then page 11 speaks to government expenditure and transfer payments. And it gives a little more detail in terms of how, we, how government then, ex, then expends the resources, the revenue resources. And then we go on to pilot reconciliation results. This sort of explains a little bit the reconciliation process in terms of how much government, how much companies say they give versus how much uh, the government say they receive. And then if we go on to page 13, which gives a synopsis of the mining sector, and I believe um, on page 14, licensed quarry operators. Because a decision would have been taken, and I think that was mentioned, that we will include, as part of the extractive industry, the whole question of the mining sector. That is another sector. Mining, the resources of Trinidad and Tobago, is something that we don't really think about as citizens. But mining is also something we have to pay attention to because they're not mining resources that they put there. They're mining the natural resources of Trinidad and Tobago. And we have already maintained that the natural resources of Trinidad and Tobago belongs to all of us. So we also, as citizens, have to pay attention to what is happening in the mining sector, and especially as it relates to environmental issues. So I just wanted to highlight those few things so that we are clear in terms of how we can use this tool in our various spaces and how to share that information. Because keeping it within these walls is not enough. We have to share this information in order to build critical mass so when the time comes, and the time may very well come very soon, when we have to defend the natural resources of our country, we are well informed. I want to go quickly now to the next speaker, who we all well. Those of us in the Bush and Amin and in the trade union movement know him very well. He is, of course, our young general secretary. But I just want to point out that he has worked at Petrotrin for 27 years. You don't look so. But he has given 27 years to, to Petrotrin coming from the fields. And he is here as the General Secretary of OWTU to talk a little bit more in terms of the state of that important uh, state-owned enterprise, the Petroleum Company of Trinidad and Tobago. Please join me in welcoming the long, young but experienced Richard Lee, Comrade Richard Lee, our General Secretary.
Commissary has zero. Commissary Chairman. Commissary President General. Commissary Victor Hart. Now installed Commissary Shivendam. And I need to be Commissary Senior Sir. Right. Uh, Commissary <coughs> Students. Commissary from the JTO Movement. And Commissary from the Bruce's Army. Good morning. Commerce on gaining independence, independence status in 1962. The profits of the hydrocarbon industry have brought significant financial revenue for the well-being of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. In 1967, production reached an all-time high of 65 million barrels of crude oil per annum, as quoted in the Ministry of Energy and Energy Affairs website. On average, 176,000 barrels of oil per day, oil from our enterprises, not least well, but owned by the multinational. At that time, we saw the oil and gas sector being controlled by the multinationals and managed and operated by the expatriates. And a vast majority of the wealth went to the private owners' coffers. The OWTU commerce fought for these resources to be owned and operated by nationals. We were off at that time, and still of the opinion, the firm view, that the natural resources of this country belongs to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and therefore benefits every single citizen, regardless of race or religion. We won that battle, comrades, and today we have, after years, of differently owned state enterprises or companies like Trintop, Trintopec, Trintmark, etc. Trintomark. We now have a state-owned oil company called Petrotrin. Come on, since Petrotrin came into existence in 1993, from then to now, contributed well over $200 billion in its 24 years to the national economy. Over the last few years, 2013, 2014, and 2014-2015 period, the company contributed 8.2 billion and 3.3 billion, respectively, as quoted in the TEITI report 2014-15, published in 2016. It is important to note, comrades, that this revenue is responsible for infrastructure such as schools, hospitals, roads, along with all a lot of these other social benefits. These contributions were less in these years, 2014-15, due to the press crisis. Notwithstanding that, the question we should ask is, where did all the money go when the prices were higher? This, comrades, is due to the mismanagement of the company, of the resource, of the assets, and the interference of the political parties. Come as we can see that with state ownership, our hydrocarbon resource, the citizens will reap the benefits. However, to truly realize these benefits, the first thing that needs to be done is to assess gaps or inefficiencies that exist. Presently, there's mismanagement, lack of leadership, lack of good governance resulting in the company not being operated efficiently. It is alarming for us when we have the so-called subject matter experts and comment President General called them the armchair critics, reporting to the population that because Petrotrin is not contributing as much to the state, it is time to divest. This comes we know as a lazy approach. Instead of looking to find initiatives, to find our state owned oil company to be efficient, those in charge want to give it away. Our patrimony, our sustainability, our resource, our job security, to that government we say no, we will not give it away. Not just for ourselves, but all of Trinidad and Tobago. To give away Petrotrin to private interests is to give away the future of ordinary working people to a few rich elite privateers. These elite privateers circle Petrotrin like vultures 
waiting to feed on its dead carcass. However, in their calculation, they feel the factor in one, one constant. And that constant comes as that is oil fields workers trade union. Against all odds, if and even public opinion, we defend and we will continue to defend this natural national patrimony with our sweat and most certainly with our blood. We put up to you, my fellow comrades. We sat and did our work. We consulted with the workers who ensure that petrol train operates even when the management failed. We came up with various initiatives that would see the oil production increase, which would lead to decreasing the need to purchase crude oil for refining, lowering the cost of operations, which would result in the company earning more profits and increase the contribution to the national economy. Come as all, petrol train is ours. Petrol train can and not just survive but succeed. To do so, we must restructure, and the OWTU has the formula. We are willing to work alongside any government and our management to turn our state company around. Commons, under the esteemed leadership and vision of our President General Commons Ansel George Roger, the OWTU has developed an organization and structure that puts accountability, sharp focus, autonomy, Maxim, maximum support from the workers as the key aspect to have Petrotrain operate in the most efficient way. I said earlier, but Petrotrain can do more than just survive. Petrotrain can succeed. We are leaders. We will continue to have Petrotrain be own, owned and operated for and on behalf of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. We are patriots. We are 80 years old, not me, as my mother said. I guess 27 years, we're not 80 years old. The order of ATU celebrates 80 years this year, 2017. We will always go forward ever, forward ever, and backward never. Long live the order of ATU. Long live the working class of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, comrades. Thank you very much, our General Secretary, Comrade Richard Lee. He had actually been battling with a throat infection for some weeks now, but I think he did well. Let's give him an extra round of applause for making sure he still delivered, not just standing. Making some very important points in terms of the fact that we are patriots. I think that's a very important point that we remember that at the end, we, do, we are not in a, we are not in a popularity contest. What we do has nothing to do with popularity or to be popular. It may sometimes be unpopular. As a matter of fact, it may even seem to go against public opinion. But one of the things that we are sure about is that which we do, we always do in the interest of Trinidad and Tobago and the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And we feel and we have absolutely no shame in continuing to do that work. The next speaker, our final speaker, I think this is his first time at Paramount Berlin. So he's at the image. Who is that? Uh, yeah, I'm coming to that. His first time, but he's, he wants to quickly earn his rank, so he put on the right color. So he start off with the blue. <laughs> Representing the Trinidad and Tobago Transparency Institute, he's vice chairman of the Trinidad and Tobago Transparency Institute, which is one of the civil society organizations on the TTEITI steering committee. He's a former registrar of the Integrity Commission, and one of the things that he says is that he's committed to addressing the missteps and misfringes in our young nation. So come in to speak to us on where are we, the Trinidad and Tobago economy and the local energy sector from a civil society's point of view. Please join me in welcoming Comrade Martin Farrell. Comrade Gold. Good morning. Uh, uh, allow me to introduce myself again. I am Martin Farrell, the Vice Chair of Trinidad and Tobago Transparency Institute. I recently ended my public service career as the Registrar of Integrity Commission. Now, you will see two calabash making their way around. And what I will do is I promise that 
if you can guess, the U.S. price my wife paid to them in Tobago, I would give $100 to the school boy, to the presentation school boy. So you get the U.S. price, and in fact, I will reveal the price this morning when I speak. So you can uh, listen, you have to listen to what I'm saying. My topic today begins with the question, where are we? The TD economy and the local energy sector. Comrades, I ask that we look at it another way. How do you look at the energy sector that is where we are? But before I deal with where we are, I want to segue, because my comrade here alluded to it. I want to go to a bit where we used to be. I grew up in Mouba, and I was the last of nine in a two-bedroom house. So, I mean, I thought, you know, this life was simple. But can you imagine how complicated life was The nine people plus parents in a two-bedroom house at 800 square feet? Think about it. We grew up in those days in Mova, and you know, many of you all listen, we didn't have any car. We used to have to take bus, and my job as the last in the house, I used to look out the window to see when the bus coming up the Lady Arm Road. Because I would have to say, bus come in, and they run through the track to get the bus. Now you know little boys, I looking at Zanuli thinking, and I ain't see the bus. And the mother hear the bus come. So you go, why are you <laughs> Because the bus ran erratic and all that sort of thing. We didn't have high-born water. We did have a very, very erratic. So we had truck-born water. And you always like this. I went and I see a swimming pool. One day I went and I see a swimming pool. Now the water truck used to come and fill the barrels. And I decide, now fill out water. I want to sink and I jumped in the barrel. Well, okay, because there's no water and I jumped in the barrel of water. That the other way through the water truck comes and fill again. So that was the life I had been up in Mova. We didn't have um, fireworks. We used to have, what if we had, we used to have spit and carbide in a cocoa tin, and then put a flambeau. And the combustion, then you get fireworks. Oh, you yeah, have fireworks now. We used to get uh, apples and ham at Christmas time. Sweet drink at Christmas time. We didn't have those things during the week and all that sort of thing. But now, the country has changed quite a lot. I left Mova when I was a child, but my kin and kin who still reside, who still reside there, you know, have cars and they shop in supermarkets. When I was small, it would be shop a pong of sugar, a pong of rice, that sort of thing, that's how we live. Even the squatters who never do it, he has five one water and electricity supply. Trinidad and Tobago has been involved in the petroleum sector for over 100 years. There have been considerable oil and gas production on land and in shallow water, with cumulative production totaling over 3 billion barrels of oil. Trinidad and Tobago is the largest oil and natural gas producer in the Caribbean. In the 1990s, the hydrocarbon sector moved from producing mainly oil to producing mainly natural gas. The energy sector contributes significantly to the economy in terms of growth and asset product, as was pointed out, um, the hard currency earnings, foreign exchange, government revenue. Nevertheless, as recently as 2012, oil and gas accounted for about 40% of GDP and 80% of, of exports. So oil has always been, the, 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 the energy sector has always been important in our economy. In fact, while researching this um, this presentation, Candice, I discovered this thing and I'm going to read it to you. I didn't know it. But, you know what I found out about Trinidad? 
even with cyclical growth, the citizens benefit, benefiting from a quality of life that surpasses that of not only most other Caribbean islands, but other Western hemisphere oil exporters such as Mexico and Venezuela. And get this, the country also enjoyed a literacy rate higher than Italy, a per capita energy consumption rate that exceeded Britain, a per capita newspaper circulation above that of several Western European countries, and get this, an income distribution comparable to that of the United States. So, the energy sector has been very, very important in creating these things. We have to talk about the energy sector allowing us to have a certain way of life. Common Rule spoke about the hospital. We take for granted that we go to school, that teachers get paid. It all comes from the energy sector. But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I have something here that I want to let you know. The abundance of oil revenue expanded the state's role in the economy and allowed the government to, among other things, adopt two policies. This was in the 1960s, when the OWTA was one of the, the um, paramount um, and, and, and leaders against foreign ownership of the, our oil resources. It was led by the WTO. And then we know what happened to the black oil revolution. But two policy positions were taken. Increase the transfer of subsidies, and increase the amount of, of transfer of subsidies in the economy. And two, the nationalization and localization of industries and the creation of numerous state-owned enterprises in various sectors of the economy, including the energy sector. I think it is very important that people know what used to be. Um, we spoke about it, uh, the Victor Yusuf were growing up. It used to be owned by foreigners. The dividends and taxes received from the oil companies now allow us to have a certain way of life. Before, they would go to foreign owners. Uh, we have dividends. We have some of us have shares in companies, and you get a dividend check, the foreigners will get a dividend. And the companies that existed here before. So a policy was taken to localize and nationalize the economy. Ergo, when people say, oh, these, these companies, ah, you know, we should uh, privatize them. We should privatize them. It's just to, because either they don't know our history, or as we pointed out, they speak on them of ignorance. You know, they just repeating what they hear. You know, talking points that we hear, we repeat them. It. But it's very, very important to know why we went, why we got to this place. I told you, I was with, I brought it over. We didn't have water, we didn't have light. I mean, now the country, 50 years, fast forward 50 years, how do you think we get these things? The energy sector. And at the time, I would think that uh, committed political leadership from uh, Eric Williams and the other side. In fact, uh, Roger, I had the I had the benefit, Comrade Roger, I had the benefit of hearing Dr. Scotty Lewis, who used to be Eric Williams and um, the economic advisor. He used to be an interim minister, and he told me how Eric Williams would come and say. We have to give people something. We have to give. <laughs> and he, he was talking about how policy was being shaped. We have to get these things that the people would say. And I used to be amazed at, you know, the. In fact, I, I, I got a respect for each other. In that, you know, we, we, we had to figure out, because we didn't want to expropriate it, we had to figure out ways to get these things. But guess what pushed them on? The Black Power Revolution. You see that? That Black Power name? That created a watershed and it gave the just uh, Eric Williams then got the motivation to move ahead with the nationalization, localization. In other words, these things didn't happen just by facts. There is a philosophy, there is a principle that guided these policies. So the things are, oh, they need to be privatized. So, all right, what I'm, I'm coming to the end of my talk. 
So I know, I know, I, I, I see this too, but it's something that's only the only the guy the hundred dollar. Now, I want to touch a bit on the subsidy because um, I don't know how many of us are aware that the impact that subsidies have had on our lives, but comrades, subsidies are, are how everybody from the rich to the lowest enjoys the game trainer. And here it is. According to an article in the Express, Trinidad and Tobago is a subsidized nation. The country has one of the largest capital GDPs in the Americas. As a result, the population receives significant benefits from government transfers and subsidies. These subsidies, these subsidies, young men, are the right of the citizens to benefit from the country's bountiful natural resources. In other words, some this nonsense you know, listen, I was in Singapore in 2011. In Singapore, they gave every citizen cash. They gave what they call that growth dividend. Every country gives subsidies. In Singapore, I've never been of a country given subsidies back before. But the mighty Singapore, who is always held out to be, oh, they're so efficient, they gave out citizens got cash. Right? They got cash because Singapore had done well, and the government thought the citizens should get. I, I have never seen it in any other country. But another thing um, I have, how have the transfers and subsidies have the citizens enormously? Really, I told what we have in MOBA, the theater ago, and I looked at the transformation which has since occurred. I am not aware of any country which does not provide subsidies to citizens. In fact, Capitalist America, did you all know, is one of the biggest subsidy and tax and transfer countries in the United States. They are tax and the transfer funds. That's all four states like Mississippi get money by federal government. They subsidize. So when these economists go talking, blah, 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 it's just throwing away credit. Anyone's going to do And, um, we spoke about the Heritage of Civilization Fund, which has covered of the, of the oil revenue. We have spoken about um, other, other programs which came out of the, the energy sector. Now, the, we, right now, we are in a situation where things are a bit, you know, not too rosy. Hence, my circulation of the resource of Calabasas and circulation. We have a, a crisis with foreign exchange fees. Because again, the energy sector, of which is the life of the country, the energy sector, that's how we, that, that, that underpins every other sector in the economy, the energy sector. That, my wife and I went to Tobago. We didn't have to get any foreign exchange. So no foreign exchange to go to Bego. Now, we didn't have to get have any US to buy anything. So I asked the question, how much US do you think these two calabash cost? How much US? I just give the answer. It costs no US. No US, but I still give you another one. <laughs> But I get a map to So, ladies and gentlemen, the energy sector, we have to rally around the OWTU. Let's begin, um, and I'm not going to uh, just read our history. It's very easy, very simple. Just the other day, well, most of you are, are younger than I am here, but I remember the island being a very, very different island. A very, very, and a lot of people marched and, and, you know, people went through a lot to get to where we are. So don't just, um, you see, you know what happened now? You see, we all have cell phones, and we all have things, and we drink up with water, and we think, so we think that, oh, we listen, <laughs> do not get complacent, you know? We are a small country, we two little islands. Let, 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 let's, let's keep up our head together, 
and I want to thank you very much. And just to remind the audience, um, Victor, I cannot go without saying this. The civil society organization and the union can help with the subsidy program. Now, I know the subsidy and transfer get a lot of knocking because we all, we all remember life sport, don't we? We start the program. So people point to these things and say, look how horrible, whatever happens to the government spending money. No, it's these things are not properly monitored. And I believe there's a critical role for civil society and the unions to hold people over the fire. Because, you know, these things are important. If you look at the subsidy, there, there, there are hundreds of subsidy programs that can use that can, um, the elderly, all this sort of thing. We can't just say, oh, they're inefficient. We have to make, we have to make them work properly. And, and just to remind the audience that Trinidad and Tobago was recently adjudged as the 101 least corrupt country in the world out of 175 countries according to the 2016 Corruption Protection Index. Do you know that in 2001 we ranked 31st? Now we are ranked 103. Come on, let us work together. Get get there any better, to get back up. Okay, so thank you very much. And um, you are my, my camera. Well, you didn't just wear the color. Your intervention shows indeed that you are a cover. Let us give Cover Farrell another round of applause. Saying two very important things. Is that money really changing? <laughs> I think you have to share it with your others, huh? You can? Okay. <laughs> now, I, I, you made a very important point about the economists. And you're about to say that I realize you're, you're, you're stopped. But just to let you know, this is the OWT. This is part of the So we will say, they are frauds. Those economists are frauds because they know better. But you see, here we go. They want to get paid as consultants for the ECA, the Trinidad and Tobago Manufacturing Association, the Chambers of Commerce, because I see them advertise for when ECA and Arthur Lockjack have an economist, blam, 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 blam. They are frauds, and we need to call them out on it. So we'll say it for you. Come on, don't worry. Go down with you. Set up fraudsters. And this thing about subsidies and transfers. So here what? So they want to reduce subsidies and transfers for the poor, working people, but we must ask, how much do big business benefit from transfers and subsidies? You know what it is, yeah? Oh, we did? Yes. With tax breaks and so on. Let us, you tell us, before you touch our subsidies and transfers, how much do businesses get from subsidies and transfers? We cannot be complacent. I think that was the key message. Do not become complacent because the things that we have today do not for one minute think that there aren't a class trying to take it from us. One of the things about neoliberalism is not about wealth creation, it's about wealth transfer. To take as much as they can from us, the working people, in order for them to have even more benefits and more profits and therefore greater wealth. I want to open the floor now. We have about, I would say we, we allow about 50, we want to end by about 11 o'clock so that it's not too off. But I would like to, we always in the forums like this, uh, give priority to the students um, in that you will be called upon, whether as a collective or someone representing the group, will be asked to make an intervention based on what you hear, what you will hear this morning. But in the meantime, I'd like to open it up, but I'd like to place a time limit, because that's what the distribution of, of wealth is similar. I can't have one person speak for 10 minutes at the expense of others. So we distribute the time equitably. So the more people we want to intervene, it simply means that in your time, you will just have about two minutes as a maximum to enable your fellow comrades to make a point. Now, I know sometimes it's hard. All right, I saw the secretariat is doing an um, evaluation form. They're going to hand it out now. 
So they're just asking for everyone to just fill out as an evaluation form, which asks about your impressions of the information. Um, this is always useful. I would suggest comrades fill it out because it helps organizers, including ourselves, when we organize the next TTEITI forum here to get a feedback from you. Okay. So, with that public service announcement, we're going to go straight to, let me see who's at the mic. Just present yourself at the mic. Come right. Make sure it's on. Good morning, everyone. Alston Goodrich, President for the Fair Branch. Come Chair, President General, members of the the grouping presented here today. I'm concerned, let me say before, before I say that, I am always pleased to attend these forums, you learn a lot. But I am concerned as to whether Petrotrin, in following of the footsteps of Texaco, have two books. Petrotrin does all its trade in the US. And why is it that we have the accounts in TNT dollars? My question, therefore, is what is the conversion factor, factor actually used to convert from U.S. to TT? Because if the day you are saying you're converting it at 6.42, tomorrow is at 7, what really is the conversion factor used uh, with regards to the accounts when it is presented to Trinidad and Tobago? And I have also looked through your booklet. I am still, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I would like to see the conversion factor also used by, by your group in, with regards to the account used uh, for us. I hope that, I'm hoping that we could get an answer with regards to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Comrade Goodrich, and keep it within the time. And a very, and a very important question, actually. I, I hope Sean can start quickly doing his arithmetic. We'll take a few, all right? Um, in terms of that conclusion, because that, that, that conclusion point is a very important point. All right, we we open it up again for another intervention. Yes. Theophilus Joseph. That's a good morning. Theophilus Joseph, Secretary Treasurer for Um Zoom. Comrades all, that's a good morning. I'm looking at the map on page five of the booklet. And it grows my observation, my curiosity, that for reserve being the largest not producing clean petrochemical is left out of the Ministry of Energy and Mark. Mm. Right? That is a very important field in petrochemical. Uh, secondly, Comrade Farrell, um, addition to, to the example used in Alaska, the citizens are given my yearly uh, payout based on the revenue to my or companies. Um, in Petrotrin, we would have had issues with um, the data that comes to Petrotrin from the lease operators in terms of unscrupulous behaviors. And I just want to cite two examples. In Brighton, our operator would have been tampering with the flow meter, advancing it to their benefit. In Forest Reserve Block 9, an operator would have been selling crude to Petrotrin but upstream there has a, a, a bypass line coming back to their tank battery. For years they would have been doing that. Now, the question is, how credible and how real is the data that is collected? And do the EITI has the ability or the wherewithal to challenge the data that is given voluntarily by this entity? Secondly, do the EITI need an act of parliament, a legislative power to be or to remain in existence, to remain independent, and to have the ability to challenge this data that has been independently given to you to do your um, analysis of our revenues attained from our end? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. When 20 seconds over, I'm counting. But um, an important second question, and I believe the TTIITI can respond to that in concrete terms, in terms of legislation, because it may come to the point where OWTU may have to do some rumbling with regards to, to that. 
And of course, the issue of, um, interestingly raised that comrade on page five, because if you look at it, that is a question of leasing out and farm out. Because the thing about privatization, they learned the lessons from 1980s, eh? So they wouldn't come out and say, yes, we're going to privatize. What we have to be vigilant about is different forms of privatization. So that same page five, if you look at the yeah, block name and the current operator, API, Range Resources, T-Rex, Massey Energy. You have to watch Massey Energy, huh? Eh? A&V Oil and Gas, Primera Oil, that's another one. New Horizon, hmm. Range Resources again, Goodrun, Goodrun EMP, A&V again, API again, Primera again. So these are our private interests. So we have to, that is something um, that we have to pay attention to in terms of that question of leasing out and farming out as a form of privatization. Eh? We have to be clear that it's a form of privatization. Let's take a few more um, before I ask the panel to respond to a few questions. I think students are, ah yes, they're ready. All protocols observed. On behalf of the Presentation College family, um, first we would like to express gratitude for the cordial invitation here today. Additionally, we'd like to thank the OWTU for sharing interest in the proletariat, the working class, protecting us against from the bourgeoisie. Um, additionally, all right, comrade, it's something good. Um, we we were going through the data, and we just um, wanted to know if it would be possible for us to obtain data on the service service um, companies like Schlumberger and Halliburton, and how come it's not possible for us to obtain data on these companies who definitely play a big part in our um, energy economy and so on. Thank you, Comrade, for that intervention, but a very, actually a very important point. Um, because we have the list of the companies here, but these are other companies, um, but the CT, the other, or the, or the who, yeah. Who owns what? <laughs> the who. But I think the TTITI secretary will respond, because that came up in some of our steering committee meetings. All right, I'll just, um, all right, let me just ask the, the panel to respond to a few points. The conversion factor, um, the EITI legislation, the question of service companies. Yeah, thanks for the questions. In regards to the issue on, on the US conversion factor, what is done basically, companies pay these taxes in US dollars. Uh, it is, conver the conversion rate uses the central bank conversion rate. Uh, so that, uh, of course it fluctuates, but the revenue that we capture is the conversion rate of the day. For instance, if, if, uh, if the treasury receives the money in, on October 5th, what is the conversion rate that day is used? Um, and then it's amalgamated with the total payments of that company from the year. So it's not just an average, but an actual uh, uh, conversion rate on the day that the, 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 the payment is, is recorded. Uh, in regards to the... the, the service company uh, uh, that's a, a very good question uh, currently because of the, the, the name of the initiative tells you what what we are what we cover so it's extraction right so the companies that extract and produce now these companies of course will hire service companies uh, a lot of the issues around some some we argue that okay the tax breaks that the companies get to 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 do exploration work and so on is linked to to what they pay to the service companies. Now, EIT, of course, uh, it, while it focuses on the extractive sectors, the extractive and, and production companies, uh, the, what will happen is that EIT is basically anything that you want it to be. So if, for instance, there's a call for that type of reporting, then it's something that the, the board can discuss and talk about. Uh, we are planning to bring in midstream and downstream companies like the companies in Point Lisas. That is not a requirement of the EITI standard. So the EITI standard is very flexible. It gives you the, 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 the power to innovate. So who knows, maybe maybe in the next five years we may be reporting on, on, on service companies as well. Maybe we'll be reporting on local content spend and so on. So it, it, it's, it, it's an innovative initiative and it gives you the opportunity to bring other types of data uh, and report on other types of data.
Well, the, the legislation, in regards to the EITI legislation, the it's currently before the, the, the permanent secretary, the Ministry of Energy. Um, it goes to the Minister of Energy and then it goes to cabinet. Um, then it goes to that, that, that process. But in terms of independence, the EITI standard, which are the rules that we follow and the requirements, calls for independence. Standard number one calls for, for uh, it basically calls, it, it demands that civil society has a space to voice its concerns within the, the, the EITI, within the ITI implementation. It, 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 it requires that government re removes any, bl um, any blocks to disclosure, removes any obstacles to disclosure. So again, the independence is really catered for within the, the actual EITI standard. Uh, there are civil society charters that must be followed and so on. So uh, the, the legislation, while it would make EITI governance mandatory, currently, no decision can be made uh, that, that, that basically tramples on the, on the independence of the multi-stakeholder uh, group that governs this process in Trinidad and today. Okay, it's, we have about four, four more minutes. So we take about three, three more comments. Okay. One. Oh, there was the, the challenges in terms of, of production verification and so on. Uh, these issues are, are, are discussed at length in the report in section 7, the full report, not the summary that you have, right? And it shows the difference between what the ministry has reported and versus what the companies have said they, they produce. All right, going twice. Yeah, I'm going. Good morning everyone, Corey Dillon, Secretary of Trinidad Tobago Registered Local Association. First of all, I want to thank the and the entire GCOM family for inviting us today. Um, it was very informative. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to share some information that I, I learned today. Um, I probably came in here an average citizen with respect to certain things, um, especially the subsidy and the privatization of petrol trains. I'm living empowered, so I understand why certain things should not happen. I didn't come here with that information, so thanks a lot for that. Um, my question now is concerning the reconciliation figures. Um, I'm looking at it on the, on the, in the report, and it's always less. Now, you said that at times, when I mean less, what the company says they give and what the government says they receive. Is it that any transaction that delays that process result in the government receiving less? Thank you. That's a, that's a, a, a good question. But what happens in the, with the difference? And that's why I made the point of the, the unidentified receipts. If you have an unidentified receipts, uh, and we had unidentified receipts in previous years, uh, then that, that you, can't, you can't verify uh, where, where that um, unidentified receipt went to. Uh, because we have no unidentified receipts, we can state with some level of confidence, in fact with a lot of confidence, that the difference that you see there is reconciled and we can find a reason for it. So there's no leakage whatsoever. All right, so we will want, let me ask the panelists if they want some final Just to extend what Sherwin said, in some countries, the discrepancies in the report as identified have led to a police investigation because of suspected corruption and people have gone to jail. And that has not happened in Fernando de Vigo yet. But it could happen and, and therefore the EITI process is a major disincentive uh, to corruption in the, in the energy sector. My closing comment is that uh, we who are overseeing the implementing of the EITI in Granada will recognize the importance of this initiative to the future well-being of our citizens. And therefore, if, say, one or two of the, the unions present here today or the youngsters from um, of Presentation College feel that they may want us to come and speak to their group separately, 
just get in touch with us. Uh, your uh, contact information is on the report. And uh, we'd be very happy to come and bring the good news of the EITI to the students of Presentation College or to the members of uh, other unions um, of the, in addition to the members of the OWTU. So please call on us if you feel you would like us to pay a visit to your organization to share with you the important uh, news of the EITI. And it was a pleasure speaking with you guys today. Uh, we look forward to the, the next opportunity that the OWTU will, will give us. Thank you. Again, uh, in closing, all I want to say is that uh, the data provided in the EITI report uh, is important data. Uh, share the information with your friends, your families, talk about it. Uh, give us feedback as well on how we can improve the reporting process. Uh, what would you like to see in the report? Uh, your feedback is critical and take the EITI of personal importance to you. And also uh, on our website, we have the full report. What we've given you is just the summary report. So the full report has much more information that we provided. And again, it's always a pleasure talking uh, to you. And any questions you have offline, we can take it afterwards as well. As come as the whatever to you again, and the common chairman will say it that um, we thank the EITI for coming here today to have this public forum and to share the information. And I think uh, it's on the website, which is where I got some of the information I used. It's on the website, the full report, so it's there. And come out, with respect to Petrotrin and, and the contribution to the national economy, one of the things that we had to look at is that over the past two years, we had no bunkering happening. So foreign exchange was at a loss during those periods, but the bunkering process should be starting back soon. And those discussions are happening with UWT. So we continue to fight and fight for the best interests of the country. Yes, come on, Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, um, my closing remarks is to remind us of where we came from and how we got here and the role of the energy sector in that trans transformation from where we were from. So young men, take note, protect it, guard it, it is ours, and don't just flippantly, you know, dismiss the, the babble and oh, no, no, take it seriously. Because there are a lot of struggle to get where we get here now, and, and God, it took your life. Thank you. Let us give our panelists another round of applause, please. <laughs> All right, you All right. Thank you, comrades, for filling out the forms. It will help us in improving, um, improving. I understand that there's some extra breakfasts as well. Um, I would like also, comrades would have received a, a what is a poster, a flyer, a big flyer, um, a very important um, memorial lecture. And you'll see OWTU always trying to build consciousness always trying to share information. We have a lecture, CLR James Memorial Lecture, with the featured speaker being Comrade David Abdullah with an interesting theme. Bearing in mind that we have the Dutch elections on Wednesday, and of course we see one of those far-right uh, populist leaders, I think he was heading the polls leading up to the election, so we'll see what happens. Then we have Mary Le Pen, of course, in France. Um, we see the rise of right-wing even within Latin America with the uh, removal of some of the more progressive governments. And so it's a very important topic for us to be clear about. And so the theme is the rise of right-wing nationalism and populism and CLR James's thesis after Hitler, our turn, Tuesday the 28th of March at 6 p.m. You don't want to miss that lecture. Um, my final word before I hand you over to our educational research officer who will bring you, uh, make a statement of appreciation. My closing statement is, is a very short and straightforward one. That the Oil Free Workers Trade Union mark our words very clearly. Will fight, will fight, will struggle to defend the interests of Trinidad and Tobago. And we will fight.
with the support of our comrades from the other trade unions, CWU, Fire, Amalgamated, the Registered Nurses Association, BIGU, and some 18 unions that make up the joint trade union movement. We stand to fight with our blood to defend that which is ours, as our foreparents did before us, and as we will do now, to guarantee a future for our children, our grandchildren, and those young people. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, comrades. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank all of you, all of you comrades for coming out today to share this very special moment with us, and also to to receive and to reflect upon the very, very critical information that was shared with you. I just want to leave you with the thoughts of our President General and echo the sentiments of my chief that we, the OWTU, say no to privatization and against the prostitution of our natural resources. Also, I'd like to thank the Chair of the TTITI Secretariat for coming here and sharing with us the importance of the Extractive Transparency Initiative and how much it has advanced the role and the understanding of our natural resource, our main natural resource. Of course, Sherwin Long, our comrade, for coming here and letting us further understand what exactly that means and how it affects all of us personally. And to the rest of the comrades on the table, and of course the Transparency Institute, I extend a heartfelt thank you to all of you, each and every one of you, for coming out and allowing us to better understand how this resource affects each and every one of us as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Last but not least, thank you for all the comrades and all the supporting help. Thank you for coming out today, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day. Forward ever, backward never. So that, that was it, come on. Yeah. Right, let's see other side. Uh -huh. Oh, we will. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. On behalf of all of the people of Trinidad and Tobago.